on ancient trails the online archaeology forum of the sharma center for heritage education india brush the dust of long forgotten thoughts slice through time and space listen to stories in stone whispers of voices lost in time build bridges across worlds curious minds reach out to the past and travel down ancient trails so thank you everyone and uh, thank you for joining us here for uh, this wonderful talk for today and i'll hand you over to uh, dr prachi prachi over to you yes ma'am just a second uh, is it visible my screen yes perfect okay. carry on yeah okay. hello everyone good evening and i welcome again Uh, Dr. Matt Po, and thank you so much for coming back on the Down Ancient Trail series. And uh, those who don't know Dr. Matt Po, for them he is a prehistorian and geologist based at the UCL Institute of Archaeology. He has been leading early prehistoric projects in Britain and uh, the Channel Islands for that last twenty years. His experience spans excavations at high-profile ISIS sites such as Goxtra and La Cote de Saint Vellet, and he has helped lead a multidisciplinary, resulting in high-profile uh, discoveries and over hundred uh, publications. His research interests are focused early on early human behavior, especially the use of space and landscape by Neanderthal populations. and the deep origins of anthropocene challenges we currently face he is committed to exploring how the study of human origins can help uh, shape a fairer safer world and to sharing research through events social media and broadcasting he is uh, today he will be speaking on uh, the box box grow horse uh, butchering site and his uh, abstract is present on our website so you can go through it there one small announcement we have our uh, youtube channel uh, now uh, where we are uploading all the down ancient trail series talks and to get more updates on them please do subscribe and like our channel and one small announcement as it were for our audience please do not uh, record today's talk and please do not take any screenshots and without taking any more time i welcome uh, dr matko and please do share your screen and you can continue now thank you matt it's really wonderful to have you here and this talk will be available on youtube later yeah. so um we after a little bit of editing and processing so look look for it there as well so over to you matt and thank you again for being here Thank you, Shanti, and thank you for the invite to come back and uh, talk to you again. It's been one of the most memorable achievements of lockdown amongst the Paleolithic community that you've put together this incredible series and created this incredible archive. And it's a real honour to have been invited to be a part of it. And uh, I'll be now giving a lecture about GDP seventeen, and it'll be recorded and it'll be on YouTube. And I'll never need to give a lecture about GDP seventeen <laughs> ever again. So uh, I'm going to try and make this maybe the definitive one. Of course, I'll talk about it. Uh, of course. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Um, here we go, and I'm going to just uh, start it from the beginning. Come on. Oh, I discovered that you can. Have a customized pointer, so I'm going to use that today to help you, help you through. Okay, so I'm going to be giving effectively the the lecture 
of um, the recent publication, the monograph that we've just produced on the GDP 17 horse butchery site. And uh, it's wonderful to be able to share the, this talk with you. Um, of course, the fine detail is gonna be there within the monograph um, itself. Um, and it's really great to be sharing it with um, lots of friends and colleagues here. I can see here on the attendance um, list, um, lots of uh, familiar names and, and even some contributors. So we'll go to the full list of contributors, but in terms of the nuts and bolts of um, what I'm going to be presenting here, really a name, name check out to Sylvia Bello and Simon Parfit, who of course did an incredible study of, of the fauna, I'm not going to talk much about the fauna, but we'll kind of intersect on that. Um, Rob Davis, um, Adrian Evans, Annamie Camilts, and Mark Roberts, who all to, to varying degrees, you know, contributed on the nuts and bolts of the archaeology. And of course, the project was directed by Mark Roberts, the excavations there from 1982 through to 1996. Um, but this is just one um, locality we're talking about today, a test pit called GTP 17, Geological Test Pit 17, which came to be known as the Horse Butchery Site. But much beyond the, the effectively the authors of this paper, of course, we could mention so many people who have been so important in making um, this happen. Um, I was at school still when uh, the, the excavations began, but on the ground, Jamie McKenzie, Indira Mann, Louise Austin, alongside Simon Parfit, doing the nuts and bolts of the recording and the excavating, we would not have this record. We would not have this site. We would not have this publication without, as you'll see, the recording they undertook. Of course, the whole framework of paleoenvironmental specialists we have working um, with us, Richard McPhail, Micromorphology, Richard Priest on mollusks, Simon Lewis, who has provided geomorphological and uh, geological uh, kind of frameworks for the site, Mark Lewis on pollen, John Whitaker on ostracods, um, and uh, our, you know, sadly missed now colleague, Peter Hoare, who helped us with, um, you know, working on different aspects of the ge geology of the site, sadly lost um, last year. Um, the publication itself, I've got to give shout outs to um, Louise Rayner, who oversaw the management of the publication for us here at Archaeology Southeast at the Institute of Archaeology and effectively managed the, the, the final analysis program as well. Fiona Griffin, who uh, put together such an incredible looking publication. Lauren Gibson, who did the reconstruction art, we'll see it later, and Antonio Reese, who, who put together the, um, uh, the, the photography. Lots of other people, the support we've had from Chris Stringer, Clive Gamble, Nick Ashton throughout the project. Um, the impact of fragmented heritage and the funding from the AHRC, from Rob Davis, Adrian Evans, lots of refitting um, by Josie Mills, Tabitha Patterson, um, and support on the wider project from colleagues, Anamika Milks, Paula Garcia Madrano, and Laura Sanchez Romero. Um, we're not stopping at GDP 17 and uh, we're already looking to the future and what comes next. Of course, behind this all is the funding and support that we got from English Heritage, the National Heritage Organization, and now um, Historic England, who, um, who, funded, who funded the publication. Um, and without, without that support, going back to 1982, we wouldn't have this record. I just want to give a shout kind of to steer on what kind of the Box Grove record isn't for me anymore. And of course, the other site that, you know, I've been been working on recently, um, you know, with an overlapping team, lots of similar people, but slightly different people is Lacotte St. Bernard, which is almost half the age of um, Box Grove. The exciting thing about Lacotte St. Bernard is it's, it's got us to look at, you know, you know, true kind of home base sites, sites where you can see material being brought in to a centralized pace, whether that be raw materials, recycled artifacts, um, secondary butchery accumulations of material taken from primary hunting sites and built and processed, or against the backdrop of controlled fire use, um, a more complex uh, sort of use of materials. I hadn't really dug middle Paleolithic sites of this complexity before Lacotte, and my, my experience had been in the more open landscapes of the, the North European Achillean, where we could not see where hominins were sleeping, where did they go when they were ill, where did they take shelter, 
you know, trying to find, you know, home base is a grand term, but trying to pl find places where hominins are living in the um, in lower Paleolithic records, in the early and the early middle Pleistocene is really difficult. You get some standout places like Wonderwork Cave, um, you know, maybe get, Ben Yakov as well. You know, maybe maybe we can talk about these as, as, as sort of more you know complex um, places. But for the most part, we're dealing with butchery sites or extraction sites or places we suspect are butchery sites, but the bone hasn't preserved. Um, so in in our book, Crossing the Human Threshold, we looked at what happens in the middle Pleistocene, maybe happens in different places at different times, but broadly speaking, the archaeological record looks very different before 600,000 years ago and a, a bit after 600,000 years ago as we start to see that record changing. Well, we're very much with the Box Grove record so far, you know, over 100 localities um, sampled. Um, we're getting variations of the same sort of things in this landscape. We're getting recycling and movement of artifacts through the landscape. We're getting single episode butchery sites. We're getting overprinted sites where butchery is taking place more and more, you know, I'm sorry, on a, on a number of different occasions. But we're not getting anything else. No hint of fire, no hint of secondary butchery signatures, no hint of uh, accumulations of different uh, different materials in, in places, but we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So let's think about where we are. We're on the south coast of Britain. We're around 480,000 years ago. We're towards the end of marine isotope stage 13. Um, we've got a series of sites that are strung out along this uh, foot of this uh, chalk. Chalk is like a fine limestone escarpment. And we've got a coastal plain here. And this coastal plain has a whole series of high sea level events covered by terrestrial and gelifluction, you know, periglacial deposits. This has all risen up out of the seabed over the last 480,000 years through tectonic uplift. And you have a whole series of, of high sea level events representing pretty much every interglacial between half a million years ago and the present, and maybe some lower sea level stands during cold stages it gets a bit murky and a bit complex on the lower part of the coastal plain. But the oldest of these raised beaches and the oldest cliff line here, as I said, around half a million years ago, we're completely connected to the continent. There's no English Channel as such. Even with a high sea level, the South Downs continue over to France, the, the chalk ridges um, and the, the land in between extend. And basically we're dealing with a small embayment of the North Atlantic during a warm stage with high sea level, cutting in and forming some amazing cliffs. That high sea level event has a signature of beach gravel and seabed marine sand, which has does have an archeological uh, signature of kind of rolled and mixed hand axes and large cutting tools within that beach gravel, but it's very sparse. Really, we talk about the raised beaches, but it's the, the deposits over those marine deposits that we get the really interesting archeology. span In the intertidal deposits, as a, as a lagoon forms, and then in the um, head deposits, as the cliff that's formed starts to, to erode and some land surfaces form. There we have Boxgrove sat in the middle of the raised beach, which we've mapped from Arundel to Westbourne, distance of around 26 kilometers. Boxgrove is a site that's really called Amy's Earthen Pit. Um, Amy's uh, being a roadstone corporation, being a, an aggregate uh, uh, extraction company that started in the 1970s, excavating out these big quarries, quarry two, quarry one. And in 1974, a geologist called Roy Shepherd Fawn and a Paleolithic archaeologist called Andrew Woodcock discovered in the sands and the deposits in Quarry 2 um, this incredible archaeological record. You know, fresh mint conditioned hand axes, some refitting, some bones with cut marks on, um, associated with deposits that sat between the marine sands and the overlying cold stage um, gravels. Um, by 1982, the Institute of Archaeology under Mark Roberts' direction had taken on this excavation, opening up these big open area excavations, Q1A, Q1B, um, that means Quarry 1 Area A, Quarry 1 Area B, and Quarry 2 Areas A to D, and then the test pits that are opened up into larger area excavations, GDP 13, GDP 17, GDP 25, and GDP 26. 
in addition to these what 12 um, sites, there's you know another 80 or so small test pits that either produce no archaeology or quite dense archaeology and gives us an idea of the background texture and pattern of distribution. There's multiple levels of archaeology, but the most exciting um, level is unit 4C, which is a, is a land surface that we've now traced for 13 kilometers, a land surface that's open for a few decades at most. And we're not going to be talking about that land surface today. We will do in the in the future a little bit more. We're going to be talking about a intertidal deposit that sits under that. Um, and this intertidal deposit um, had land surfaces in that seem to represent, you know, fairly stable, um, short lived land surfaces and were picked up and traced for the most part there at GDP 17. Here's some shots of the excavations. Now, vintage shots from the um, 1980s. Um, the site was excavated between 1988 and 1991. Um, and uh, we, here we have uh, Simon Parfit, who was the assistant director of the, the project um, and who was leading on the, the excavations here alongside Indira and Jamie. And here they are excavating. They've, um, we've got the overlying cold stage gravels here you can see the junction with the land surface. This is the unit 4C land surface just sitting here. Um, this is the one that's been traced for, for 13 kilometers. And then below that, you get into these intertidal silts, which had more than one level of archaeology in. But this level, the second level, is the clay lamination that was traced through this excavation area. And each of those little black um, specks is a little flag made out of electrical insulation tape wrapped around a tiny little nail marking every artifact bigger than two centimeters. All the smaller artifacts are just bagged up by quarter meter square. Um, and here they are being recorded, um, bags being written out for every single artifact, a compass and a hand tape there measuring the position within each 25 by 25 centimeter no, it's probably a, sorry that's a, a 50 by 50 centimeter um square um the orientation of each artifact the declination of it within the sediments um remember this is pre-digital this is before there are um in it edms as we used to call them before there's total stations before lasers can record rapidly the position of everything everything had to be done by hand every artifact had to be uh, piece. And as you've got napping scatters here, of course, sometimes the artifacts are several artifacts deep. So once you've gone and recorded the scatter and recorded the position of every artifact, you can only lift a certain number and then you have to go back doing subsequent lifts. The key to the recording is shown here. Simon Parfit balancing. Um, don't look because um, you know, this is ba balancing on a piece of wood on two buckets on another piece of wood while smoking a cigarette with um, uh, uh, an SLR um, in hand. This was 1988, obviously, before uh, uh, we, uh, a different approach was taken with, with health and safety. Um, and what he's doing is he's getting an overhead um, photograph of part of the excavation. Now, these were done with SLRs. They were also done with large format cameras as well, creating very high resolution photographs. And of course, there was no digital photography. So these photographs had to be developed very rapidly because they were integral to the recording process. They were taken to the nearest pub, the Anglesey Arms, and they were developed in a, in a dark room that had been set up in a bathroom at the pub, which meant that the team could come back the next day before the artifacts had been lifted with a large format photograph of a half meter square um, and that could be drawn on and annotated, drawing a line around for every single large artifact and a number being given to it. That was traced onto Permatrace, a documentary record was made as well, and then the artifacts could be lifted. So you've got the photograph, you've got a paper record, you've got the Permatrace record, three different records, none of it digital, the whole thing analog and the whole thing painstaking. Here's some photographs of different parts of those excavations um, taking place at different times. I'll come back to this lovely little cluster here later on. You can see, I, you know, we, we show quite often different napping scatters. I quite like this one because um, it's not a particularly typical one. We've got a really, really lovely definite knee here. Maybe another little indistinct knee 
here there's a really clear edge to it as well i don't know you know it's very you know these edges are either limbs or body parts or maybe other things you know who knows a bit of skin or something like that some vegetation these are perfectly in situ they're actually piled up really quite high because they piled up between napper's legs on the edge of napper's um, thighs and so they're quite three-dimensional objects and sadly you know we've got these very two-dimensional photographs of them now if we were digging it today we'd probably use photo well, we would use photogrammetry to capture the kind of the, the 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 lumpiness of them we've looked we've got nowhere near enough photographic coverage to try and do a retrospective um photogrammetry on it some other lovely photographs of the site under excavation and there you can see some of the inked up um, half meter um, uh, squares. Right at the end of the process, all of these inked up illustrations of each half meter square was brought together. The site was dug very piecemeal in a way, you know, over over um, three or three or four years. So it wasn't really right until the end when this uh, master plan was put together. All the open uh, shapes are stone artifacts. All the filled in shapes are pieces of fauna that you could see there was a real kind of texture pattern. Yes, you've got behind it a background scatter of small debitage and of spools. We'll see more of that later. But foregrounded on it are these really tight napping scatters with really sort of definite edges to them and these triangular sort of uh, patterns suggestive of, of, of legs. And in the middle, this kind of slightly suggestive, slightly more open space. So let's kind of pick apart this data now and the work that we did um, bringing it up to up to date and of course entering those analog computers and exploring them in, in GIS and, and interrogating them. First of all, you know, we just begin with topography. Always topography is absolutely key. And this is topography of the site, quite exaggerated by the color map, I'm color ramp I'm using. You know, we're only going to going here from uh, 40, 40.4. Uh, meters above sea level, right the way down to 39.9 meters above sea level. But this is a real surface. It's a real surface in an intertidal landscape, a landscape in which sea level, um, maybe once a month or maybe a lot more regularly, is entirely inundating and introducing silt. And then when sea level falls, is moving away. Now we now know that Boxgrove sits within a semi enclosed marine bay. This tidal rise and fall would not be associated with any kind of heavy wave action. It's going to be very low energy because it's essentially taking place in a very sheltered embayment. But still, when the tide runs out, that water is going to find itself forming drainage patterns. And what we have here where the land is falling away to the um, east of the site is an intertidal creek, is um, a little channel that's full of slightly a uh, deeper, slightly wetter um, intertidal alluvium, and here a slightly drier area on the edge of the site. You can see a little bit of that sort of um, here where you're kind of going from the slightly drier uh, area that has artifacts in falling away into the slightly wetter area. There was some soil micromorphology taken right on the edge of this that actually Richard McPhail could actually pick out. You can see that topography. It's absolutely tiny, but this area is wetter and more poorly drained. You can imagine in the intertidal lagoon, a period of time in which water is filling this area, but this area here is, is dry. Um, we're going from landscapes from, you know, open cliff foreshores, um, which would have sat there, which sit there right underneath the box growth sequence into a landscape like this, which is a, a harbour, or well, sorry, an inlet, tidal inlet today on the Sussex coast with these slightly higher grassier areas um, dissected by these little intertidal um, creeks. So we can look at kind of broadly analogous landscapes, stick this intertidal landscape in front of these cliffs and you've got a good approximation for what the Boxgrove landscape would have looked like at that point in time. If we stick the gross distribution of fauna shown in red and the gross distribution of different size classes of artifacts in green, you can see how with a bit of overlap on the edge here, a little bit of disconnect, we've got a broad you know, uh, agreement of more dense archaeology uh, more dense napping scatters as the ground gets a bit um, higher 
and drier. And as we'll see, even in this area here, we can't explain the absence here due to, due to erosion. There might be some movement of, of artifacts here, but there isn't you know, high energy processes at work here. And this isn't a big channel flushing out material. It just seems to be in a slightly unattractive creekier part of the landscape. So let's look briefly at um, site formation processes. I don't want to go too deeply into it, but you know, I don't believe you know the term in situ that we bandy around doesn't e really exist. You know, whatever we're dealing with, if we're dealing with a fine-grained record, if we're dealing with you know very low energy um, processes, well, there, there is energy there. Burial is taking place, um, even if you've got wind bringing in you know dune sand or, or fine lurse something is going to be moving there something is going to be changing so you can have things that are essentially in situ but we should always be looking for degrees of modification degree of movement and thinking about the formation of, of the sediments um we carried out you know a number of different analyses looking at the fauna i'm just going to be talking about how we looked at the lithics we looked at um, the gross composition of the assemblage. We wanted to make sure for the whole site and for parts of the site, if anything was underrepresented. So we've got here some uh, uh, experimentally de derived expectations um, for different percentages of different size classes of debitage. This is from making a different uh, 100 different hand axes out of the same raw material that the Boxgrove hominins are using. And it gives us this kind of irregular corridor of what looks normal. And the GTP 17 size class curve sits entirely within that, looking entirely normal, entirely as we would expect. If we look at size classes in a different way, on the left here, we have different size classes of lithic artifact. On the right here, we have different size classes of fauna, going from small to large, from small to large. Well, on the left here, you have exactly what you would expect from a, a relatively in situ primary context site in the sense that the smaller artifacts, one to 19 millimeters, are forming identical spatial concentrations to the larger artifacts. The small material is not ending up sort of redistributed or distributed in a, in a different part of the, uh, of the site. I won't go into explaining too much about what uh, is going on with the fauna. That's a lecture that um, Simon can give some time. But if we just compare different size classes of fauna uh, on the on the right hand side, you can see there are different distribution patterns here. Smaller material makes an intense concentration here up in the top northwest corner, a more wider distribution of uh, mid-sized fauna, and a completely different focus for the large fauna here. So Whatever the explanation for that is, and you can come up with, with, with your own, um, there is a case to answer here. Different size classes of fauna are being distributed in different ways in different parts of the site. Something is going on. Stone artifacts, just like the other thing, are consistent with what we would expect with a very, very well preserved um, site. Similarly, both for the whole site and for different parts of the site, we can find no preferred orientation for the artifacts. No flow processes, either sediment flow or water flow, was rearranging artifacts with a long axis and rearranging them in the direction of a preferred flow. Simply not happening. When we got onto the refitting, of course, and the refitting was carried out in more than three stages. Just have a sip there. Um, there was refitting carried out whilst the excavations were taking place, with parts of the site being recreated in the farm uh, that everyone lived in um, and, and beginning in the 80s and the 90s. There was a phase of refitting that I did in 1994. I did another phase of refitting maybe somewhere around um, 1998. Um, I had a small child who kept on wanting to get involved in it by then. Um, and then there was another phase of refitting we'll talk about later that was funded by the AHRC, overseen by Rob Davis, um, with uh, with input from you know vol lots of volunteer help that um, took the refitting further forward from say 2015 2016. Um, in total, it's still less than 30% of the entire assemblage that's been refitted. The entire assemblage 
uh, greater than 20 uh, centimeters, that is. But that's still quite a significant proportion. And it really gives us an insight into the activities that are taking place there. Um, and here we have um, some of the main refitting groups that have come out of that work. Now, to get these broad refitting groups, they were all there by the early 2000s. Um, and they weren't hugely expanded by the fragmented work, but the fragmented heritage work provided some really, really exciting refits, as we'll see. Things that took more effort to get to, refits that really required going the extra mile, you know, looking for refits that are occurring across the site. And definitely one thing that, you know, should come out from this is that, you know, refitting is an intergenerational project. You know, there's only so much energy, time and funding for any one period, any one team to achieve. Um, but it's always a work in progress and there's always going to be worth going back to it. So, you know, I know at some point in the future, um, another team will go back to this and it'll be great to see how they take the interpretation forward. I'm quickly going to run through them at the moment. We've got them in a lot of detail at the moment in the monograph. We're working on a summary paper um, to get them out there as well. And eventually, you know, we'll be putting this data and these images online. And eventually it'll be great to have um, 3D scans of all of them. Some of them have been um, scanned by Rob and Paola, but we will eventually make this as accessible as possible. OK, so um, what can you see? We've got very few kind of complete reduction sequences, but all of the sequences that we've uh, we've taken forward, the debitage is all consistent with uh, with biface manufacture. Even if the early preparatory flakes are hard hammer, you know, relatively bold, relatively invasive. By the time cortex has been removed, there is a switch to soft hammer. We're getting these beautiful little nests of flakes, where the striking platforms are preserving an upper intensively work surface, um, and then shaping thinning flakes with either bone or antler soft hammers traveling the whole distance of the underside of these preforms. You've got it again here, lovely nest going here, going from hard hammer flakes to soft hammer flakes. Unfortunately, we haven't got what's going on on the other side, which is there, you know, because we know there's a switch. We know there's a switch from this face to the other face and then back to this face. Unfortunately, the refitting is just really coming together for, for one face in, in, in this case. And again here, look, you can see that switch there, um, kind of cortical uh, to, to semi-cortical flakes here being removed, fairly bold removals. Then there must be a switch to another face because we've got this huge step back before we get these lovely um, soft hammer flakes. Um, centripetally working around, creating these convexities, working to create these, uh, working to create preforms for bifaces. We know they're taken through to, you know, being complete bifaces in many cases, because we've got the finer debitage there. It's just harder to get those large stage shaping, resharpening uh, flakes into the refits. <clears throat> we've got other things going on, like this object, this object that before it was introduced to the landscape was already essentially a finished biface. And to be now in a landscape patinating, look at that little kind of surface bloom of patination that it had taken on it. But it had been transported to this site or, or, or picked up very locally at the site. Quite hard to imagine that because this is a rapidly accreting intertidal site. So there wouldn't be really much visible from, you know, a, a few weeks before because tide, tidal silts are coming in, but it could be quite local. And then when it's brought to the site, it undergoes complete remodification, but modification by someone who understands, you know, the, the, you know, understands the principles of bifacial reduction, sets up essentially for two tranche removals. The second tranche removal is really bold, turns it from being an ovate hand axe into a metrical cleaver with really quite a blunt tip. Um, probably, you know, I, I think it's quite a clumsy shot this, but at all stages, this thing is a, is a large cutting tool but it's scavenged from the landscape, it's resharpened, and we don't find the finished object, it's taken away. Um, and then we have some larger uh, nodules, which must be nodular flint being brought from the cliff line, which sits 50 meters to the north of the site, brought on site and turned into rough outs, including this, the most complete uh, sequence. Uh, we call it the football, even though it's very um, irregular, it would have been slightly more 
uh, round when it was original. Um, we didn't have, find these very large flakes removed off one surface. Maybe that was done at the extraction site at the cliff. Um, but then really bold removals and then a void in the middle, which we were able to put latex in and get this lovely sort of bifacial rough out. There are other flakes from this showing that this was taken through to, to completion as a complete tool. But as in the case of all of them, we found no single complete hand axes at all. We know at least eight of them were there. There's another one which breaks during manufacture. We've got the butt for it, but not the tip. So eight bifaces plus an essentially, you know, complete tip, you know, that's about you know, 12 centimeters long, were not found in the excavation area and appear to have been taken away upon abandonment. In fact, there's very few um, objects that could be described as tools or show any kind of macroscopic um, useware. One is this object, a large um, flake, um, which has uh, this really quite uh, uh, severe damage on. It looks as if it's been used as, uh, you know, being put under some kind of torsion that it's been used to cut, but wriggled backwards and forwards, maybe in a jointing activity that's cracked the flint here. And lots of little uh, spontaneous retouch uh, flakes that have come off. It's, it doesn't look like this is um, from intentional strengthening of this surface, but from useware being used in a really, really robust um, way. Unfortunately, too patinated to get any microscopic useware. And then we have this. It's another big patinated flake that's been brought in. It's obviously been weathering on a surface somewhere else in the landscape. It's worth pointing out that this big flake does not fit into any of our refit groups. It's also highly likely to have been imported to the site. This patination here is quite extensive. But this is a lovely large o oval ovate flake that then has been subjected to this really quite brutal, inexpert, hard hammer flaking that removes the striking platform and the bulb of percussion here, and then just works in by facially reworking it on this side. Whoever removed this flake here, which is a beautiful flake, um, almost certainly from, from bifacial reduction, was not the same person who removed these large um, flakes here. So we've got something going on there. We, we've got people who are very proficient at napping, who are obviously bringing raw material, partially complete tools, and, 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 and completing that manufacture on site. We've got people who are very proficient at napping, finding existing tools in the landscape and bringing them on, and remodifying them, transforming them into tools of a completely different platform. And then we have these kind of slightly more kind of inexpert nappers picking up objects that are surprisingly hand axe like in their general size and shape and modifying them. We can think about who they are. Interestingly, if we look at these two tools, the only two kind of, uh, you know, utilized flakes um, with macroscopic damage, they were found right next door to each other, along with this kind of big blady flake, which is itself completely exotic. All found, no debitage, no sign of actually anything being made here, but three, you know, very curious imported objects that have been used um, in different ways. Now, when I finished my refitting in 2002 and published in my thesis, this is kind of where I'd got to. Yes, we got these tight refitting scatters. Yes, we got evidence of bits of movement, um, you know, definitely without the evidence, without any evidence for fluvial transport, I was really seeing that these long distance movement lines could, you know, most likely to be homonym uh, movement. Um, and what we had was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight main napping scatters. This one can be divided up, so maybe into, into two, um, with this fauna and a really short-term butchery episode. And we kind of came up with this idea that you had a hunting party here, um, quite convinced at the time that this horse had been predated, that it was a short-term activity involving a small number of individuals, you know, healthy adults may be involved in the hunt. But the reason why you're missing parts of the carcass elements like the feet, the reasons why you are missing the hand axes is that there was another site in the landscape where the cutting tools and the meat were taken to and the rest of the group maybe were waiting for, you know, redistribution for feeding. But effectively, this was a primary butchery site and it invoked another location in the landscape for recombination of the group. 
and redistribution of the resources. The kind of site that we just don't find in the Boxgrove landscape, this kind of you know, former intertidal environment in front of a cliff. But of course, there's other landscapes that are accessible, you know, dry valleys leading up to the woodland above. And we thought, well, you know, maybe in those places, in places which no longer survive, um, you know, to be excavated, we could invoke um, some kind of different order of activity area. You know, reconstruction drawings drawn at the time showing, you know, the chasing and hunting of uh, of horses, or you know, we could imagine the competitive scavenging taking place, driving off predators before they they got in um, to to the carcasses. Um, in both cases, here we're kind of like providing the hominins with uh, with 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 spears to either either hunt or competitively scavenge. Well, we had this wonderful opportunity from fragmented heritage and chance to work with Adrian Evans, Rob Davis, Josephine Mills. Tabitha Patterson. I'm afraid I haven't updated this slide to give Josie Mills her PhD. Dr. Josie Mills now. I'm sorry about that, Josie, if you're watching, but um, amazing resources to bring to bear on um, this collection um, and provided further refits, which as you can see here, are showing more long distance and more moving refits. Now, what I've tried to do here is show how each of the refit groups shown in a different color have these really, well, quite a few of them have these really intense focuses which occur very early in the napping sequence and then wider um, sort of peripheral areas where later um, some of the later napping takes place. And some of the flakes from the earlier stages of napping end up, it's quite complex. So if we look at refit group nine here, really intense reduction here, you know, within you know, less than 30 centimeters across this napping scatter here. But these flakes are finding their way, you know, into this wider peripheral area, real focus, maybe a movement of the napper themselves to this location here, but then definitely movement of flakes out into this area no fluvial sedimentary process that can account for that. Similarly here, refit group 19, intense focus, look at these flakes moving out into a line through here. Refit group 53, um, yeah, little intense primary reduction sequence, and but then flakes are moving out also kind of into that same line, into that same zone here. Relocation of refit group one to here, and some really long distance refits. Look, a little yellow cross here. That little artifact there has come from this uh, napping scatter over here. So a lot more complexity going on. And that's what those extra hours of refitting give you. You know, some piecing together those exciting nests is like shooting fish in a barrel. You're just dealing with these, you know, clusters here um, where the artifacts are all together and you can lay them out. Finding these means going through being far more raw material aware and there's differential patination on here so raw material is very difficult to uh to um be a great guide it just means you know um trying a lot of refits and uh putting a lot of time in there there's no real quick fixes yet but uh, watch this space on automation um so i need to just mention one of the really exciting bits of refitting that was uh uh, uh, followed up by Adrian Evans in terms of useware. So if we look at these two flakes here, I've shown them already. We pick them out for useware analysis right away. And you can see here, here's the, here's the proximal element with the striking platform. That's that flake there. This lower part here, the distal element is that flake there. Now, when you refit them back together, they were refitted together before we knew they were a long way apart. It should have been obvious. And I, I probably just wasn't observant enough. But look at how that edge there steps in. Of course, this flake was originally had a consistent line along here, but it steps in. There's macroscopic use wear here, really quite considerable macroscopic use wear. This has been used in a really robust cutting task. And when Adrian Evans looked at this, he picked up you know, really nice sort of meat and bone polish just on, on this edge here. So picking out some of these long distance refits are picking out utilized flakes. And of course we have others and we could do a much bigger program of use where if we had the resources. So these flakes moving into these particular areas aren't just sort of being randomly picked up, they're being used. 
And this is really exciting for us. I'm just going to go through um, these slides um, just to, to this point here, because we can now have this kind of slightly different view of, um, of this napping, uh, this site of the napping scatters and what took place here. Because if we originally had a hypothesis in which you had a small group of healthy adults who'd taken place in a hunt or a scavenging and needed uh, uh, large cutting tools, um, then those large cutting tools were being used to participate in the primary butchery. There may have been other individuals there with large cutting tools already made that could have participated. But what we have now is if we continue that hypothesis that we just have, say, between eight and 12 individuals here, they're investing a lot in each of these napping scatters in making fantastic large cutting tools, you know, beautifully functional hand axes, but then, pick, then, then picking up whole bunches of flakes and moving them into the center of the site. And this is the area where Simon Parfit thinks the horse carcass originally sat. Look at that, how these flakes, you know, sit around a kind of strange empty area in the middle of the, the site. Coming to the edge here, there's another kind of sort of edge and possible activity area up there. So we wanted to propose off the back of this that um, these flakes are being used by other individuals. That in fact, the hand axes are only, and the hand axe, hand axe manufacturing is only representing a proportion of the population here. And that each of these napping scatters as they're being made, aren't just producing debris, aren't just producing litter that you might want to avoid with your feet uh, to avoid getting injured, but are producing materials that are valuable for being used in, in the butchery itself. And others are selecting those flakes, usable flakes, and bringing them into the butchery area. What's exciting about this is we can't put any firm numbers on it beyond the kind of generalized ethnographic analogies and analogies that are, are, are drawn on and estimates that are drawn on for effective sort of group size um, for the middle Pleistocene. But we can create space here for the whole group. That this doesn't need to be a primary butchery site that invo involves or invokes um, another location, but it can be a site in which the whole group is, is taking place. Um, and just to, just to throw something in at this point, that little cluster of uh, 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 poorly napped by facial tool, a utilized biface size flake, and this other long sharp flake imported from somewhere else was found in that little um, line of, uh, of discarded flakes taken out from uh, the wider area. So when we put everything together, I know it's quite gaudy, but it's showing the distribution of the, the spores, the distribution of all the fauna, each of those refit groups, the bone tools, which are an entire other um, uh, uh, talk that Simon and Sylvia could talk about. Um, the bone tools, some of them are made out of the horse itself. So they're you know, using and preparing the horse, the single horse that they're butchering to turn into, into bone tools. There is a lot going on here. And yet we know it's bracketed by an intertidal event. We know it's bracketed probably by daylight. This is not going to be a site you're going to carry on once the sun goes down, you know, with the with the um, pull of, of carnivores into. So once we can see all this movement, all of this preparation, the scavenging of other artifacts and the surrounding landscape, the provisioning of the site with raw material, the manufacturing of bone tools, the, the manufacturing of stone tools, as well as the extensive butchery, which absolutely smashes this carcass down to get at the trabecular bone, to get at the marrow, to get at the offal, you know, complete demolishing of this carcass. Suddenly, the idea that there's just 10 people here for a few hours becomes more and more untenable. And then we get the exciting idea that, you know, beyond the early reconstruction drawings that were drawn from this site by Simon James back in the 1980s, which show a kind of a demographically diverse but relatively small group. I'm going to skim over some of these more kind of epic uh, reconstruction drawings we've had for Boxgrove um, in between. Um, we arrived at our own new model and our own new reconstruction drawing drawn by Lauren Gibson um, to represent what we believe there is space for at the GTP 17 site, which is a period of um, a few hours, maybe no more than 12, between intertidal cycles in which you have 
the whole, you know, habitually associating group, the entire demographic, where for this period of time, the carcass is not just the focus of tool manufacturing behavior, not just the focus of butchery, not just the focus of consumption, but the entire focus of social interaction, cultural interaction um, uh, of, the, of the entire group. The entire, you know, Boxgrove hominin life is here for this period of, in time. And so we believe you have children here. We believe children are being enabled um, to take part in the butchery. That's almost certainly for us what some of those flakes mean. Um, some of those inexpertly, um, you know, made by facial tools, you know, could be an expert child child, um, uh, you know, uh, and nappers taking place. But not everyone needs a large biface. Once the bifaces are maybe used for primary butchery, again, a kind of enabling, you know, everyone can get in with, with smaller flake tools. Everyone can take part in the smashing open and the breaking open of the, the carcasses. And over a period of few, few hours, this horse is completely, completely processed. So, um, you know, this is a little reconstruction drawing to explore. We've been ambiguous in what we're showing. We're ambiguous in, in gender in places. We're ambiguous in age. But um, what we just want to show is everyone is here and this is not um, an extractive place. It's not a butchery site. It's not a manufacturing site. This is a social site as well. Um, so I'm going to leave it there, except to plug the book, which is available, mail order from um, UCL. I can share um, a link later on. We produced it in-house to really high standard. Um, Louise Rayner and Fiona Griffin oversaw the, the, the production of this. And we're selling for £25, which for, for academic monographs is quite, quite available. Do get in touch with me if you have any questions. Do look out for, for, for what comes next. And thank you again to Shanti and her team for inviting me to contribute to Down Ancient Trails. Thank you. <laughs>